it's to every to each person's opinion whether it actually tastes like liquid gold or not but um you know it, it, at least it presents itself you know as with that with that potential um as far as favorite yeasts go i mean i, I do have a, a tried and true wine yeast that i'll use especially on my my higher abv um fermentations and that's the the lalvin 71b not not a stranger to the mead world a lot of folks use that one mm-hmm. um i'll use a lot of ale yeast so I mean I, I'll I'll use a lot of SO5 just because it's a really basic clean, um, you know fairly high um, ABV fermenter. I'll, I can get you know 13 or so 13 percent alcohol out of that pretty readily. Um, this last time around with the cider, um, I have one that's got squash in it, and I used a Bavarian wheat yeast from can't remember what it was used a couple packages of that because i'm going to add some spices so i figured the spiciness you know the 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 phenolics and esters from the from the yeast itself probably would be very complimentary to that um i think i used i know i used another ale yeast on a batch of cider that's going to have um some maple syrup in it another one that, that i thought you know would would have some some spicy phenolics that would that would match up well with that um i'll do a, a bit of lager fermentation on meads as well so I, I don't know how common that actually is i i'm i'm sure i'm not the only one who've tried it but i don't necessarily hmm. hear, hear about it all that often um yeah i used to lager a lot when i when i made beer but uh i haven't tried it with the uh, with mead yet but it sounds it'll probably make a very nice dry mead i would imagine so so here's the here's the the reason why i did it um so last year i got um some mesquite honey and um i used that with cider to make a sizer in a small batch and it was the time of year where the the the, the crawl space off of my basement was getting pretty cold and i had lager yeast around and i'm like hey you know what it's staying in the low 50s in the crawl space why don't i just put this carboy out there with the lager yeast in it for three four weeks and see what happens it had the most wonderful aromas by the time it was done i i just Mm. you know it and the mesquite honey itself has killer aromas anyway and i really felt like the the lager yeast the slow gentle fermentation you know you don't have as much um you know volatility in the fermentation so you're not blowing off nearly as much you know aromatics out through the airlock so this year i wanted to do it again and i got a honey uh, from oaxaca and mexico and again mm. took took a taste of that honey smelled it and i'm like okay this is a perfect candidate for a lager fermentation because it's got aromatics in it that are really beautiful i can guarantee you i would lose a lot of that if i did a a, a regular you know room temperature fermentation so i've got it sitting in my firm fridge at 54 and it'll probably take three to four weeks for it to finish and right. just like you would if you were going to lager a beer it'll be brought out of the fridge um, you know, left at room temperature a few for a few days to let the yeast kind of scrounge up any diacetyl or any other stuff that, you know, it's got laying mm-hmm. around in there. Um, and then, you know, it'll get cold crashed so I can get the the meat off the, the yeast and then, you know, it'll just go into regular packaging. Um, it's a fairly high ABV sizer, so it'll go into a regular wine bottle after that. And I think, you know, commercially, you've got to have the equipment to do it. You know, you've got to have the, the temperature controlled vessels where you can get down that far with the temperature and, you know, yeah. if you need to do any cold aging, but to me so far, I've done a couple of experiments with it and it's, um, it's paying off, especially if you have the right ingredients. You know, if you've got a, a honey, that's just got beautiful, beautiful aromas to it. Um, I, I also think there's some honeys out there that typically, have uh, insane pace of fermentation. So I know, I know you guys were talking about uh, meadow foam uh, honey mm-hmm. with Eric a couple weeks back. Mm. Um, the the kinetic profile for for meadow foam, so that the pace of fermentation um, is is ridiculous. You, you do that at room temperature, and it'll the yeast will rip through that honey like mad and create a ton of alcohol. Yeah, I bet you a lager fermentation probably would get you a much more um, a less steep curve it would take a little bit longer just because the yeast is less active 
because it's cooler. You know, it's designed to work mm -hmm. cooler. It's it's a slower pace. So that's going to be in one of my next experiments with lager fermentation is to to get you know a a, a, a lager yeast that'll go down. I might even try to get one that'll go down to like you know 48, 50 degrees, and just do a batch of metal foam traditional with a lager yeast and let it sit there and take as long as it wants, um, because the first time I did it with metal foam. It was probably 65, 66 degrees, and it's it's been in the bottle for eight months, and it's still hot. Hmm. It is just okay. ridiculously hot. And you know, I, and I'm sure I probably could have started with less fermentables to be able to do that, but I still know that the fermentation would go so quickly, and I I don't I don't think that that is beneficial to a well balanced finished product, unless of course you introduce a ton of time for aging, and I guess I'm just not that patient. <laughs> <laughs> I want to drink. <laughs> well, that's why you, you know, make want, want... that's why you make the fast meads so you have something to drink while you're waiting for the slow meads. That, that's you true. Know. Yeah, it's, yeah, well, it's that's all the about layering, about you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the session meads are great because they're sitting in the in the cooler and the kegs, and I can go down and take those off the tap anytime I want, and the other ones can sit around. So yeah, I I, I would definitely agree with that. So, but I, I think you know. It, the experimentation with yeast, I've used a whole bunch of different ones this year. Um, I, I can't say I found anything that, I, that I'm hugely sold on. Uh, I'm looking for the number for one that I used uh, most recently. Uh, where is that? Hmm. Uh, come on, where are you? Um, have you been using Cote de Blanc quite a bit? So I it's like Cote de Blanc. Similar, yeah, very similar to 71B. Little lower alcohol tolerance. Um, so you know, again, it it you can work with it if you're kind of if you're working your um, your your alcohol down a little bit. Um, RC212. So this is mm. this is a red wine yeast. Yeah, not I one of my favorites. The, at least yeah, not uh, not North Carolina temperatures is not a good place to do that. <laughs> no. uh, I didn't have that problem with it, but it's a real whiny pants for nutrients. Yeah, it is. Yep, definitely is. So actually, and we'll get back to this in just a second because it actually brings up a topic that we probably want to talk about, which is Boche. Yeah. So one I was looking for is 5-8-W-3. Oh, Okay. I just used that a couple times this year, and I'm going to go look it up because I want to read off why I picked it because it sounded really interesting. 58W3. Yeah, so it's from Scott Labs, and uh, uh, let's see. It says, allows for the release of bound terpenes. Okay, so it's going to get funky and technical, but I'm reading it off a spec sheet, so this is mm -hmm. not, these are not my words. Um, allows for the release of bound terpenes in aromatic varieties due to beta glucosidase activity. So it's an enzymatic activity. You know, at least I can understand that. Jesus. <laughs> um, and I grabbed it because it's Pinot Gris, Gewurztraminer, Riesling, Viognier, and Semillon. And if you oh. think about fruit profile on all of those grapes, yeah. you know, beautiful, beautiful white grapes. And it's it's so this yeast was cultured to help. Um, you know, promote those types of aromatics. And, and again, I know these are wine yeast, and they're they're you know specifically designed to be chemically active in the right conditions. These grapes certainly are going to be very different than honeys. But I was just thinking about if this yeast is designed to really accentuate all the beautiful aromatics in these types of grapes, then you know it's it's got to work for some nice, beautiful floral honeys because those those delicate aromatics are probably based on a lot of the same chemical compounds. So hmm. I just makes, happened yeah. to be looking, looking for new yeah. yeasts, and, and that was one that, that, that came up. So if anybody out there is looking for an interesting yeast to use, I used it on some local wildflower honey that I got from a friend. And this honey smelled like rose petals when huh. we first got it. When nice. we pulled that out. I mean, so my first guess was is that wherever these hives were this year, somebody must have had a rose garden. Yeah. So it was a good guess, but it turns out we were wrong. Hmm. By the time it was done fermenting, it tasted like conquered grapes. Yeah. What? So I bet 
that the bees got into wild conquered grapes because this guy lives in a pretty rural area um, east of us and I know there are areas around there that have a lot of wild yeah. conquered grapes and you know it just it, it tastes like wild conquered grapes it, it and I so I don't know if the yeast helped or hurt that I'm assuming it probably helped accentuate that because it just it still was very beautifully you know kind of floral and and then you get you taste it and you're like whoa Whoa, Welch's, Welch's grape juice? Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's interesting so it, that it brought out an underlying floral component that you didn't see when you first had the honey unfermented. <laughs> I think that's yeah. fascinating. Yep. Well, so that's actually really kind of a killer segue into the Boucher topic because that is actually something that I don't think I've seen a lot of people mention about Beauchets yet is there's something about caramelizing the honey that does something to it that when it's fermenting it and and as and after it's done it tastes different than fermenting that honey straight up not oh, absolutely just, not just the caramelization though it, there, it's it's even more nuanced than that and I and again I don't know what the the chemistry is here but a wildflower honey tastes more like red fruit when it's been caramelized and then fermented. I don't, I don't know if it's just the Dutch gold wildflower honey that does this. Maybe it is, but I've done this several times with that honey with the bow shape. Mm. And man, it is ridiculously of like raspberries and red currant. And I've I, nothing else I've made with it tastes like that weird <laughs> okay so it's caramelization i'm like that wouldn't be what i would guess would be the flavors that would be created from that doesn't happen no let, that that's the thing i, I i've got a um a boche here for, a, from red gum that um is very floral and threw some very nice floral flavors when i when i made it normally but um when i boche'd it and fermented it, it it started coming all through the ferment was apples and then when it was finished it, it was like oranges yeah, I mean, and I, and I, again, I don't, I don't know. What I can tell you is, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm completely addicted to it. I, I <laughs> made it just in the last three weeks, I've made four boches <laughs> with wow, a whole oh bunch my. of different honeys, but just because I, I'm experimenting with just subtle differences in time, like 12 minutes versus 15 versus 20, it just mm. to see, you know, what is what's different about it, like where. You know, when I get the the boche mixed up, taste it. Can I taste the difference? You know, in the twelve versus the twenty minutes. You know, okay. And then when it's done fermenting, what's different about it? And certainly the level to which these concentrated, nuanced flavors come out is definitely different, even in a matter of just a few minutes difference in caramelization. Um, you know, so it, for me, it, it's it's an interesting, again, an interesting extension of that palette it's something another way to use honey to create a, you know a base for stuff you got all kinds of obvious things you're going to caramelize honey you start thinking about ooh you know chocolate and you know you know other other things that can that can really blend well with it you know peanut butter so we've got a pb2 we've we've thrown oh my yeah pb2 well, so, really Fun. Yeah, so here's the thing. Uh, so remember uh, I told you about that honey that, that tasted like Conquer grapes? Right. Well, we both we both shade some of it. Oh. And holy crap. Great jam, man. PB2. Yeah, we added the PB2, and it literally tastes like peanut butter and jelly. Oh, it, my God. Peanut butter jelly time mead? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You know, oh, it's, God. Yep. So, and, you know, again, one of those things where I didn't have to add the grape. That's what I think is so cool about it. It's been done before. Superstition has one. I've not had it. I'm hoping to at some point. I'm probably imagining that it's going to be stellar. But what's so cool about this one is I got a similar profile out of it, but the Conquered Grape came from the honey, and I have no idea why because the guy I got it from has no idea either. Huh. He has no, he's like, Conquered Grapes? He goes, really? Huh. I guess I'll have to look around while I'm out near the hives you know, next year because he's putting them in the same place, I guess, just to see are they around somewhere or, you know, Again, the bees will find them. The bees yeah. will find them. So there could be buried in the woods somewhere, and he's probably never seen them. But I just thought it was neat that we get this boche done, and it's fermented, and I'm sitting there, and we're thinking we're adding chocolate to it, and I'm like, man, this tastes way too much like grape jelly to do that. It just doesn't – this isn't right. And like, I got PB2 upstairs. 
that's where I'm going with this. And so, so what's the PB2? Powdered peanut butter. Okay, okay, we were.